Yeah, the, the, the timing of the conference uh, and uh, coinciding with the World Cup is great. Because uh, then most of you will know what I'm talking about. Um, I'm going to actually continue uh, the theme from uh, Stephen Law. I will also talk about language. I will give you two things. I will talk about the, uh, the language surrounding strategic fouling. And then I will talk about um, compensation as a response to strategic fouling, making it OK, because you are compensating people. Yeah, so uh, uh, yeah, I, uh, I mean, philosophers, they give us great arguments about what's the right thing to do, what's the wrong thing to do. But sometimes it's quite interesting to look at the language normal people use, and uh, that might tell us something about the phenomenon we're interested in. So, uh, and because I grew up speaking several languages, of course I, I can compare stuff. Um, so that's, that's my interest here. But first, let's, uh, let's just briefly define the professional foul. Um, so it's a foul committed uh, Oh, let's, let's do it differently. Well, a lot of fouls are accidental. They are due to fatigue, bad preparation, wet pitch, and so on and so on. Then there are other fouls which happen uh, in the heat of battle, uh, biting, <laughs> <laughs> or uh, you know asserting yourself because you've been roughed up. So, uh, and then there's a third type of foul, which is the strategic foul, also known as the professional foul, and in other languages known as the tactical foul, but we'll stick with strategic foul. And there, this, the, there's the difference between the strategic foul and the other types of fouls, the accidental fouls, or the, the ones in the heat of battle. Uh, the, the difference is that the strategic foul is done openly and uh, the punishment is taken willingly. And the reason is, the reason for that doing that is because you gain an advantage. And you've all seen that in the, in the World Cup. So let's say a striker is in front of the goal. The last defender is just behind him. He will chop him. Yeah, because this is the better deal. Because if you let him go, he will certainly score a goal. But if you chop him, uh, okay, he might get a, uh, he will probably get a penalty shot, but the penalty shot might not be converted, as happened in the Croatia game. Luka Modric didn't convert. He was fouled. He was in front of the goal. So the other types of um, fouls, uh, once you're penalized for them, you don't actually retain an advantage, okay? You know, if the, wet is, if the pitch is wet, you slide into another uh, person, you get, uh, you get a free kick, you know, because it's, it's obviously unintentional. And uh, so it doesn't really give you a, a particular advantage. But that's what the, the strategic foul does. You retain an, uh, an advantage after taking the penalty, yeah? Uh, so, right, let's, let's talk about, yeah, it's interesting that the strategic foul is often by commentator called a professional foul. Uh, now, uh, professional, I'll give you some de definitions, uh, means uh, conforming to the technical or et ethical standards of a profession. Another, another uh, definition, exhibiting a courteous, conscientious and generally business-like manner in the workplace. Now, I don't think anyone will, will think that committing strategic fouling is courteous, conscientious, uh, maybe business-like for uh, these professional athletes. Uh, and uh, conforming to technical or ethical standards of a profession, possibly to the technical standards because they're all doing it. Uh, ethical, I'm not sure about that. But what's interesting is, Calling it the professional foul, yeah, the adjective professional is positive, has a positive connotation, but that doesn't mean that this carries over to the foul. That doesn't make the foul a good thing, yeah? So don't be fooled by that. Um, 
Now, so if we look at various languages and how, what people are doing, um, I noticed that in German, of course, you use an euphemism to refer to a strategic foul. You say, die Notbremse ziehen, which means to pull the emergency brake. And there you also have a metaphor. It's not just a euphemism, it's also a metaphor transpo uh, transporting that message. Now, to pull the emergency brake, of course, is a good thing. When you're on the train, there's a fire, of course I will pull the emergency brake to help everyone, for the good of all. Yeah? So it's, it's, uh, it's the right thing to do. Uh, and also, uh, in Dutch, you have, you have basically the equivalent phrase to pull the emergency brake. Um, in English, as you all know, you, you hear that phrase, to take one for the team. Yeah. So you're also sacrificing yourself. You're doing a good thing. Yeah, maybe it's super erogatory. Yeah, you're doing a great thing for the team, sacrificing yourself, uh, taking yellow card or red card. So these types of uh, euphemisms, they're trying to normalize the strategic foul by practitioners, fans, commentators. Yeah. Uh, now in Brazilian uh, Portuguese, I love that. They call it the providential foul. <laughs> <laughs> so there is, they are appealing to higher power, providence, or even to God. So, uh, and then of course we all know Maradona's uh, hand of God. So the South Americans, they're somehow very close to God when, 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 the t when they're talking about football. Now in European uh, Portuguese, uh, they talk about the surgical foul. Uh, so it, it's if a surgeon is removing a threat. That's a good thing, yeah? So you need to get rid of it. You need to get rid of the cancer. Um, so here's another euphemism. Uh, in Canada and the US, where the most fervent philosophical supporters of the strategic fouls live, they live there, uh, they, commentators and everyone, they talk about the good foul or the smart foul, yeah? But, uh, Another American philosopher, uh, Fraley, says it's only good or smart for the fouling team. It's in their rational self-interest. But these types of foul, they are not good in terms of the good sports contest. Yeah? They're only thinking about themselves, not thinking about what the sports contest is supposed to do. And namely, in my view, they give a fair measure of performance. Yeah? Um, and then, so, so this is a little bit about what normal people talk about, ordinary language uh, surrounding uh, strategic fouling, but there, are, there is actually a, a philosopher, uh, John Russell, who wrote a paper last year, Strategic Fouls, A New Defense. So to me that also tells you they're desperate, they need to come up with uh, justifications. Um, so he says, uh, there's a playful character to games. And uh, we see, for instance, in children's play, that children often transgress. And we accept that. Yeah? Uh, and he also mentions, uh, uh, to shore up his argument, Tom Sawyer, uh, who is imagining all kinds of evil things that he's doing with his band, killing people uh, and joining pirates and all that stuff, as you know. And then he's also using humor, he says, well, in humor, humor is a good thing, but sometimes we transgress when we use humor. So, you know, we make ethnic jokes or, and so on and so on. There's a transgression, of course. Uh, so he's using all that to say that there's this playful character in when children break the rules. And uh, if we accept that with, with children, then maybe we should accept it with grown-ups. Now he says we should really call these fouls or use the same language we use for children because we say, we use uh, expressions like shenanigans. Uh, he says, I'm quoting now, they are shenanigans, that is morally objectionable or doubtful activities that are tolerable even if we have sound reasons for moral misgivings or moral misgivings about them. High jinks and antics are other words that do similar work. 
So he says we should tolerate strategic fouling when they bring delight and overall add something positive to our lives. Now, my question is, who's delighted? I am not delighted at all. I get annoyed when I see it. You know, who is delighted? I don't know anyone who is delighted, except for perhaps some diehard fan or the team who did the fouling. So, even though Russell accepts that we might have moral misgivings about such actions, he fails to stress the effect of the language he uses. Yeah? Uh, these terms that he's using, shenanigans, hijinks, uh, antics, they are used when we describe what children do. Um, they are particularly associated with the boisterously playful behavior of children. These expressions have a euphemistic function in the context of strategic fouling and suggest that employing the strategic foul is morally harmless or just good fun. Yeah, of course, uh, we're okay with children breaking the rules. You know, we play with them and we laugh. We, we find it's funny when they break the rules or when they cheat. Yeah? It's very funny if you do that with little kids. Yeah? Because that's a, that's a stage in their development. That's, uh, that's a, uh, yeah, develop, de it's a developmental phenomenon. But grown-ups, grown-up uh, grown athletes, they're, they're, uh, they've already grown up. They don't need to do that. Yeah? So it's a completely different reason why we accept uh, rule-breaking and cheating by children. Yeah? And that doesn't carry forward to grown-up athletes. Uh, so in my view, that's a mistake. Uh, and, but it's interesting that he's, he's trying to suggest, yeah, we should use that language. You know, we should say, oh, it's shenanigans, antics, hijinks. Um, uh, so I found it amazing that philosophers come up with this stuff to defend strategic fouling. That's what, why I actually started you know, writing about it, because I can date the moment when I became interested in it, because philosophy sport is a niche subject, you know, nobody's interested in that, very few people. Um, I was watching the World Cup four years ago in Brazil, and every day I was watching it, I was getting more and more annoyed. There's nothing delightful about it. And I was thinking, why are you getting annoyed? Because these people get penalized after all, so everything is okay. Yeah? And so this is where I start thinking about this stuff. Uh, but in, in, other, in some languages, there, there is nothing. We find nothing. Yeah? I mean, I, I did a little survey. An Italian colleague said to me, no, no, in, in Italian there's nothing. We don't talk about it, we just do it. <laughs> um, and uh, so I, 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 said, uh, I introduced some euphemisms, and uh, of course, there is also the opposite. And I, ha I had to look up what the opposite of euphemism is. I didn't know that. It's a dysphemism. Uh, so, and that was also interesting. Of course, I know the Germans well. Uh, I thought that the Austrians would have the same expression to pull the emergency brake, but no. The Austrians talk about Torraub, which means literally um, goal robbery. <laughs> so that's a dysphemism. It's a bad thing. Uh, so here the metaphor, goal robbery, expresses the wrongness of the strategic foul by likening it, likening it to a crime. It's a crime. Yeah, so this is great, uh, that the Austrians don't think as the Germans. Um, now, in, in Poland, I was told, you can refer to the strategic foul as a dirty trick. You say, oh, they did a dirty trick. That's also dysphemism. Um, in Gaelic football, there has been a rule change in 2014. Um, they introduced uh, cynical fouls, and these are, yeah, they introduce cynical fouls, but they cover more than just strategic fouling. They're, they are, for instance, uh, intimidating referee, stuff like that. So it's a wider term, but a strategic foul <coughs> in Gaelic football is a cynical foul. So it's a bad thing to do. And what is interesting is that these types of fouls are black card offenses. Now, I find that color interesting. Black is normally bad, a bad thing. Of course, we have black is beautiful and all that, or in fashion we have uh, green is the new black and stuff like that. Black there is positive in fashion. Uh, 
uh, but normally black is, is, is uh, black market, black, uh, black mailing, and all that stuff is normally a bad thing. I mean, it could be that the choice of color, I haven't talked to these uh, Gaelic football people, the choice of color could simply be because the referees have a black book, so they don't need to introduce a new card with a new color. They just take the book out and it's black and everyone knows what's going on. But it could be uh, you know, indicative of something. <laughs> it's a bad thing. Um, yeah, so, <clears throat> so what does this, uh, this, this use of language tell us? Well, the euphemisms clearly um, try to make light of something which is or might be morally objectionable, whereas the non-euphemistic language points directly at the wrongness of the action, or that it is morally problematic. So, the, uh, I, I, I would say that the, the bitter pill needs a sugar coating. That's what they're doing when they use language like that, euphemistic language. Uh, and in many other languages, it's interesting that South Americans, I was told that in Chilean Spanish, in Uruguayan Spanish, and in Argentinian Spanish, there's nothing. They would just say, it was the last resort. That's it. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this much about the language of strategic fouling. And now I want to talk about um, compensation. So, and, uh, and a particular philosopher, Robert Simon. So he uh, distinguishes two types of penalties. He says some penalties are punishments for prohibited behavior. And then there are other penalties. They are a price for action. Uh, and these penalties that are priced for action, what you're doing there, you're compensating the victim, the, per the team you fouled, you're compensating them, and then the, it's perfectly okay to do that. And the classic example that, that they all bring is stopping the clock in uh, basketball. Okay? So it's, uh, it's close to the end, uh, it's a tight game, so uh, let's say 30 seconds to go. So what are you going to do? The other side has got the ball. So you can get the ball back by strategically fouling. Now, if you strategically foul the team, they get two free shots, free, okay? And the maximum points they can make is two. But after that, you get possession of the ball, and then if you do a, a quick move, you can score three points with one shot, you know, regular stuff. So what you're doing is basically you're trading the possibility of two penalty shots for possibility of getting three, for getting ahead. Yeah? And a lot of people are doing that, have been doing that in the NF, uh, in the National uh, Basketball League, NBA. Um, now the rules have actually been changed in 2016, but uh, these philosophers who write about that, uh, they wrote prior to 2016. Now, now in the last quarter you don't get possession of the ball anymore. Uh, so they're trying to get rid of that, yeah, this, this possibility. Um, yeah, so compensation is a legal remedy designed to make the victim of a wrong whole again, to make good the loss or harm they have suffered. So we know that from tort law and from contract law. So if you break a contract, uh, you have to compensate the person for their losses, normally expectation damages. Um, and th what is interesting is that uh, in uh, a lot of American legal scholars think Breaking the uh, contract is perfectly okay. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm quoting one of them, David Slauson, who writes, if you break a contract, you have done nothing wrong if you pay full compensation. Yeah? And now, I do think that you have done something wrong, but I do agree that in co breaking a contract, the compensation can fully restore you or can come close to restoring you. Yeah, I do agree with that. Uh, but what is interesting is that the, uh, the incidence of strategic fouling and the philosophical support for strategic fouling, that starts in, in the 70s in the US. And this uh, view in legal 
uh, scholarship, which is known as uh, Law and Philosophy or the Economic Approach to Law, um, that also arises in the 70s. Yeah? So they, these are parallel movements. I don't know whether they have in influenced each other because some philosophers both, of course, have a uh, legal philosophy background. Not sure about that. But it's interesting that it's parallel and, and it's always in North America. Um, so, uh, th then there's another, you know, in tort law, compensation is also a remedy. So, you don't know what a tort is, that's a private wrong as opposed to a crime. Yeah? So, we go skiing, uh, me and Michael Lesswing. I'm an expert spe uh, skier, he's a beginner. So, we're up at the top. <laughs> and, and he says to me, mm, look steep. I say, come on, Michael, be a man. I push him down. <laughs> so he breaks a leg. I have to compensate him for his hospital costs and for everything else. That, and their compensation, of course, is not perfect. It will come close to covering his expenses. But of course, the, the pain and all that stuff, you know, and not being able to do philosophy. Well, I don't know, maybe while he's in hospital, <laughs> he can do philosophy. But certainly, he won't be see his children and all that stuff. That's bad. I cannot compensate for that. Um, so, in, in, uh, so the idea that compensation can make you whole again, that may work in tort law and in uh, contract law, or come close. And Simon thinks that the, strateg the strategic foul is OK if you pay reasonable com compensation. Um, but I think that's a mistake. You know. Uh, the penalties for uh, strategic fouling are never reasonable compensation. You are routinely undercompensated. Yeah? And proof for that is because they keep doing it. It's the better deal. If it weren't, they wouldn't do it. Yeah? So the compensation falls short. Uh, and, and to say that's reasonable, I mean, I don't understand it. How can you, how can you make such a statement? <laughs> it's terrible. Uh, so, it may work, as I said, uh, the grass is wet, you slide into, pre, uh, and slide into the other player, and then you, uh, they get a free kick. It may work there, and it was an accidental foul. But in strategic fouling, the compensation doesn't work. Um, uh, the victim is not... Uh, uh, so, what's wrong with the, uh, this view of uh, compensating? It is... Uh, Giving to the victim doesn't restore the victim fully. fully yeah? That's the idea of compensation, giving to the victim. That doesn't restore the victim fully. Uh, the, st the strategic foul undermines the restorative function of penalties. They're supposed to take you to a position before the foul happened. Yeah? And this doesn't happen. So another area of law gives a much better analogy and, and tells us much better what's going on here, what's, what's wrong with uh, strategic fouling, namely, that is the law of restitution. So, its central function is to deprive the defendant, that means the wrongdoer, of a gain, rather than to compensate the claimant, the victim, for a loss. So what we're doing is here in the law of restitution, we're not giving to the victim, we're taking from the perpetrator, from the uh, miscreant, we're taking from him, the fowler. Uh, so the idea here in law is that uh, they have wrongly gained, benefited uh, from an unjust action or from a wrong. They have profited from wrongdoing and uh, at the expense of another. So this is, can be applied in tort law, in, in uh, contract law, and there's breach of fiduciary duty and breach of confidence. Uh, so this is possible. And just to give you some examples, um, this uh, British spy, Blake, uh, he, he was working for MI5 or MI6, I can never remember which is which. <laughs> and uh, of course, after the war, after the Second World War. And they have to sign a non-confidentiality non non clause, that means they can uh, disclose what, what they know. Now this chap, uh, became a double agent. He was spying for the Russians. Uh, and then he, f he escaped and wrote memoirs in the late 80s or so. Uh, I think Jonathan Cape was the publisher. And of course, he got royalties. And the Brits didn't like it. So they thought, how are we going to stop this? 
because he is profiting from wrongdoing. So they used uh, the law of restitution, uh, not compensation, because compensation wouldn't have worked here in breach of contract. Uh, they said uh, he broke a contract, uh, uh, you know, not to confide stuff to others, and uh, the, law, the court ordered the, uh, the publisher not to give him the money, and I think the money must have then, I don't know whether, it, uh, whether the government pocketed the money or what happened to it, they must have pocketed it, yeah. So they took, basically, they took from the wrongdoer. Um, another example, a solicitor, uh, like gambling, so he took 500,000 pounds from his company, went to the casino, gambled it all away, and lost the fool, he lost. So uh, the solicitors uh, were trying to figure out how we're going to get our 500,000 back. And they thought, ah, there's a way of doing it, the law of restitution, because this thing was based on a, an unjust act. He shouldn't have taken the money. So they sued uh, the um, the casino, mm -hmm. and they got the money back, which is great. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, it would be much better if the guy had actually doubled the money, if he had won 500,000, and then, then I could much nicer explain to you, if we had made him just return the money, that would have been compensation. He would have compensated his company, yeah, given them the 500,000. They're now the same they were before. It's fine, they're whole. but. He still has the 500,000 he won. So in the law of restitution, we must take away his gains because they're based on wrongdoing. So what I'm saying is, if you accept this principle in law that you mustn't benefit from wrongdoing, I think you should also apply that to sports and strategic fouling. We must take away from the wrongdoer, not, uh, not just give to the, give to the vict victim because that doesn't, doesn't work. The idea of compensation doesn't work, doesn't apply. The, no, the accidental foul compensation may be, po possibly may, the idea of compensation may, may work or may, may do the trick, but it doesn't do the trick with uh, strategic fouling. All right, I'm done. Thank you. Sorry. I <laughs>